people. Peace. Peace. All right. I'm going to jump right into this today. And uh, today's topic is uh, excess. And uh, I'm starting off with uh, a story that was given to me as a request. And it has to do with uh, Juan Rayford Jr., teenager that received 11 life sentences. So the story here, the story is, it's a uh, kid is 32 years old, still still serving 11 life sentences in prison for a crime he didn't commit. This is uh, Lancaster, California, uh, close, not too close, too far from uh, Palmdale, California, my home of 17 years. Juan Rayford Jr. was 17 years old when he was wrongfully accused of attempted murder and ultimately sentenced to life imprisonment despite his non-involvement in the crime. Now 32 years old, Rayford Jr. has spent 15 years of his life behind bars and he still dreams that he could one day be free. As a teenager, Rayford Jr. had dreams of playing college football and then eventually in, uh, entering the NFL and succeeding in life, but his life turned upside down in 2004 when he was at a house party playing video games with some friends and an altercation ensued between one of his friends and another person. The friend and the other guy had a long-standing beef and it spilled over to a fight and Juan and everybody came running, said Rayford Jr. Uh, shots were fired and when the police came, they took names and wanted to know who did what. My son did nothing wrong. He had no gun and there were and there were some shots fired, but nobody was hit. Nobody was hurt. Everyone in, on the scene was questioned, but later, later on, the investigation focused only on Rayford Jr. and another teen, Dupree Glass. Several witnesses and the homeowner initially gave their statement to the police where they stated that the teens weren't involved and did not possess a gun. No one was shot or injured as well. However, Rayford Jr. and Glass were still charged with 11 counts of attempted murder each. During the trial, the witnesses changed their statement, but there were no other witnesses called on their behalf. The two young men were offered a plea deal of 15 years in prison, but they maintained their innocence throughout. On October 20, 2004, Rayford Jr., as well as Dupree Glass, was sentenced to 220 years plus 11 life terms. The sentence which pushed them in, in prison for the rest of their lives without any chance of parole seems to have violated the U.S. Constitution's Eighth Amendment that prohibits extreme sentences that are grossly disproportionate to the crime. Moreover, Rayford and Glass were just some of the youth under the age of 18 who were sentenced to life terms in the U.S. United States. 85% of its people of color, according to the Human Rights Watch. 15 years since then, Rayford Jr. remains in the San Diego area prison. And it's, uh, they're going, they're, they're trying, uh, they, they, they petitioned the Supreme Court in the state of California, and they were granted a petition by the Innocent Rights of Orange County in December 2016, and they are now awaiting a court hearing. So now, they, they've been in jail for 15 years, and they finally getting a chance to uh, have a hearing uh, whereas they you know 17 years old at the time no one was hit no one was injured no one was shot but they charged him with 11 counts of attempted murder and uh, neither one of the kids had a gun they were not caught with a gun and this just goes to show you how they can take your life and throw it in the trash like you like you mean nothing at all and just sentence you to some outlandish stuff like that 220 years plus 11 life sentences that's uh that's just utterly ridiculous uh black college student sentenced to 12 years in prison for kissing a white girl this is lawrence kansas and albert wilson a former university of kansas student has been sentenced to 12 years in prison and a lifetime of probation after being convicted by an all-white jury for raping a, a, a white girl. But he says they only kissed and never had sex. In September 2016, then 20-year-old Wilson was, was with a friend when they went to a bar where they met a girl who was 17 years old at the time. 
she was visiting her cousin who attended Kansas, Kansas University, both underage. Wilson used a friend's ID to get in the bar, while the younger woman and her cousin were, were never asked for ID. Both parties met at a popular college spot called the Jayhawk Cafe while they were dancing and uh, dancing and kissing on the dance floor with the, without knowing each other's ages. Wilson invited the girl to his place, which was a walking distance from the bar. Uh, the young woman claimed that Wilson raped her at his place. On the other hand, Wilson told a different story. He, he testified that the girl didn't seem intoxicated at all. He admitted they kissed, but they never had sexual intercourse. So the uh, Kansas Bureau of Investigation found Wilson's DNA, DNA on the girl's chest through his saliva when he kissed her there. No DNA from seminal fluid was found. Swabs were collected from the girl after she went to a local hospital after the incident. So they didn't have any evidence of any rape. They didn't have any, uh, they did a rape, rape kit and it was determined that she was not raped. But they charged him with rape anyway. And let's see here. It was a chance meeting. And if there was ever a case that deserved a departure of any kind, I think this is it. After six hours of deliberation, the all-white jury decided to convict Wilson of rape and, get, and gave him the reported lowest end of what's called by, by Kansas City on the guidelines of rape. The verdict has caused an uproar with many people asking multiple questions about the woman's story, especially since the surveillance video showed the girl was consenting as they engaged in one another and they were only at Wilson's place for five minutes before returning to the bar. Some of also questioning Wilson's lengthy sentence compared to other convicted rapists. Oh man, you guys gotta wake up, man. You gotta wake up and uh, and and start checking the paperwork out. Let me see your ID. I I want to see your ID. I want to know all that. I want to. Don't tell me you you 21. I, I want to see it. Here's a black woman who couldn't afford a $500 bail found dead, dead in the jail cell. Laylene Ponico, 27-year-old woman, was found dead in a jail cell in Rockers Island in New York a week before she was due to be released. If she, if she could not afford to pay the bail, she would have to have been re released, sentenced, uh, released earlier if she had been able to pay the bail. Polanco was produced was pronounced dead an hour after she was found unresponsive in a cell. She is known to have an illness that causes sudden seizures, but is not yet determined if that or what the other factor is that caused her death. No signs of violence or foul play were found, according to the New York Department of Corrections. That investigation is cu uh, currently ongoing. Polanco was arrested in April for uh, allegedly attacking a cab driver and possessing a controlled substance was about to be released the next week after she died. So that's another another person that has been arrested and uh, ended up dead in custody. There's another case here. There are 64,000 missing black women and girls in the United States and no one seems to care. A, two, a 2010 study about the media coverage of missing children in the United States discovered that only 20% of reported stories focused on missing black children, despite it corresponding to 30, 33% of the overall missing person cases. Conclusively, the report stated, missing black youth, especially black girls, are underreported in the news, and it seems that many people don't even care. According to reports, when black girls go missing, it's often unclear whether they have run away from home, were inflicted, by violence abducted, sent to into the sex industry, among others. Basically, their safety and assurance to be brought back home was commonly ignored and not in utmost concern. As of 2014, about 64,000 black women and girls were missing in the United States. However, most of those did not receive enough media attention and public support to be found. In efforts to, to address the problem of missing black children nationwide, 
Representative Bonnie Watson, Robin Kelly, and Yvette Clark initiated the Congressional Caucus on Black Women and Girls in 2016. Though the caucus, through the caucus, they hope to create public policies that eliminate significant barriers and disparities rep experienced by black women. And this is a uh, tragic case where you have a lot of black women. I had no idea that that many black women were missing 64,000 since uh, 2014, as of 2014, 64,000 people. That's, that's amazing. That is an amazing way out number. Here's a six-year-old six autistic boy was the youngest person to ever attend, attend Oxford University. A uh, young black, black kid named Joshua Beckford who was living with, with high functional autism, became the youngest person to ever attend the prestigious Oxford College in England. Now he's 13 years old. He's been there since he was six years old. Beckford is ready to take on more, cha more challenges as he sets his sights to be a neurosurgeon and to save the earth someday. Beckford was just 10 months old when his father, Knox Daniel, first discovered that he is not just a typical child. His son was sitting on his lap in front of the computer and he could already memorize and understand letters on the keyboard. He was three years old when he started reading fluently, using phonics and speaking Japanese. He taught himself to touch type on a computer before he could even write. At the age of four, he played on his dad's laptop with the body simulator where he could be, he would pull out, or he would, a body simulator where he would do surgery. He has been molded so well that he could already deliver PowerPoint presentations tacking, tackling human anatomy to audiences of 200 to 3,000 people at commuting, community fundraising events. Daniel knew his son's brain was too advanced for a standard curriculum. Beckford was homeschooled before he, because he doesn't like children his own age and he only likes teenagers and adults. And what interests him is ancient Egypt that he is now working on writing a children's book about it. In 2011, Daniel found out a special program at Oxford University the children ages 8 to 13. Even though he was just six years old, he, he enrolled him to challenge his, his bright young mind. Beckford, who was two years younger than the usual applicants, then became the youngest student ever to be accepted at Oxford University. He took courses in philosophy and history through their online program for gifted children where he got distinctions in all of his classes and was recognized with a certificate. As a super smart black kid and this is a story you didn't even see on the news on TV. Here's another good uh, good story I'm trying to end with a good, on a positive note here and this is uh, Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. Uh, Keisha Lance Bottoms is the mayor, a uh, black female mayor of uh, Atlanta, and she also happens to be the daughter of singer Major Lance. Uh, the older people from the older generation remember Major Lance uh, from the 60s and, and 70s uh, doing his thing singing. So Keisha Lance Bottom says that her city has successfully raised $50 million funding goal initiated almost two years ago to provide 550 homes for its homeless residents. Atlanta has over 3,000 homeless residents and it was found that one of the biggest challenges has been to connect them to available services. To solve the problem, the city has decided to integrate the rapid rehousing model which will quickly provide a temporary home to its homeless residents that they could focus on rebuilding and addressing the factors that actually led to their homelessness and avoid becoming homeless again. It is a, a misperception that many people have that homelessness is, is represented entirely by people they see on the streets. As far as a large proportion of peer, people experiencing homelessness have incomes and function at very high levels but live on the margins of economics of our society and any hardship can derail. About $25 million sep reportedly came from private organizations such as the Marist Bank 
which was the last to contribute 114000 before the city reached the goal. The other half came from the homeless opportunity bond sale that began under the former mayor. The city partnered with the United Way of Greater Atlanta to raise the funds. The city announced its plan in 2017 after the city, the city's largest homeless shelter that housed up to 500 people a night had to be shut down due to health and safety concerns. Bottom shared that she is excited to finally reach the goal which has started, which was started when she was still a member of the city council. This is one of the things I had the fortune of walking into when I was mayor. So this is a, that's a feel good story and this is what I'm gonna try to do. I'm gonna always try to end my, end my uh, broadcast with a positive story. So that's, uh, that's my story. Hey, hey. folks. Peace.